Hi, Paul. All right. Hi. Ryan, good, good to see you back. Yes. <laughs> All right. Um, now, there's a, cu a couple of issues I always like to get a person's perspective on, and, and it's probably uh, kind of been enhanced over time as you as you've lived this way and read more uh, and that is the first is ethics so what what's your take on the ethics of living this way I think that's a key component uh, you know what a lot there's so much talk about veganism and I think just the average person isn't ready for that if they're eating animals they're not going to object to wearing animals uh, I, almost every raw vegan I know I, Really makes an active effort not to buy any any products that contain animal products, but no one's perfect in that regard. I mean, did some thinking about this. You know, I know I'm going to kill bugs if I take a, a walk in the grass. So really, no one is is truly vegan. As long as you have the, as far as you know, in my head, as, as long as you have the knowledge that you're going to harm another living creature, then. And, but this is natural for us to walk in the grass. I mean, it's. Yeah, there's so much talk about earthing these days, you know. So you're you're kind of like don't take it to an extreme, but to the degree possible, avoid harming as much as possible. Yeah, I do research on things. I I really have almost no no uh, no animal products whatsoever left anymore. I would I think I I gave away so many things, or just how I threw threw them away. And and were there any things that you learned about the animal product industry that you found particularly horrifying? Oh, quite a number of things. Uh, I, I watched that famous speech by Gary Orofsky, for example, at Georgia Tech. Yeah. Um, just doing research on different websites as well while I was writing my first book alive. It, it's just incredible that the, this amount of stuff can go on and, and, and no one knows about it. Yeah. But things are changing drastically now, and that's very exciting. There's so much momentum. Absolutely, absolutely. And then, of course, the ancillary to that is uh, the environmental damage caused by an animal product-based uh, culture. W what have you learned in that respect? I've learned that the single biggest way that we can help offset greenhouse uh, emissions is, is simply by going vegan. Uh, there's so much talk about changing light bulbs and driving less, but that's the biggest way. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I hope Al Gore uh, would make a, a follow-up movie to his wildly popular and inconvenient truth, because I think that could have such great impact. Yeah, yeah. To to do to emphasize the dietary aspect. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think it's, in, it's encouraging with uh, Bill Clinton having gone uh, vegan and and uh, improved his health dramatically. So uh, it, it's happening, as you say. It's changing. Things are changing. Yes. All right. Um, Let's see now. Can you tell us a little bit about, like, can you describe for us uh, an average day for you? Like, what would you have for breakfast? What would you have for lunch? And what would you have for dinner? An average day lately would be 11 oranges or three pounds of oranges plus a pound of, I use generally frozen fruit, like an acid or sub acid fruit. And my go to one, I really like strawberries. Okay. So that'll be a, a smoothie for breakfast. Uh, Generally, I eat about 9 o'clock, and then I'll move on to lunch at noon, and that will be 11 bananas and, and uh, half a pound of romaine. And I'll generally have that same meal at 3 o'clock. And with all three of these fruit meals, I, I munch on celery sticks. So I, I generally go through about one pound of romaine and then one pound of celery sticks on an average day. And then I have a big salad for dinner. Okay. And the salad's about a half pound. I like red leaf lettuce. Um I use cucumber, bell pepper, tomatoes, and some herbs and lemon lime juice. And I'll use one kind of fat. So either avocado or a nuts or a seed. Uh, I like walnuts, uh, flaxseed, sunflower seeds, and I'll make a dressing. And it's a lot of fun. I really look forward to what I'm going to create for dinner that night, whether it's going to be something new or an old favorite. And I, I have so many now. I just swap them in and out. And That's beautiful. I really look forward to it. <laughs> Now, I wonder if you could tell me a little bit about how you uh, handled making these changes in your life and then perhaps immediate family and then also the broader culture, which, you know, as you said, it's been changing, but there's also a uh, large, large percentage of the culture or, or the population which is uh, perhaps not receptive or at least misunderstands what this is all about. 
Um, how do you interact with folks? Uh, you, you know, obviously you're excited about this. You've had great personal benefit by following it. How do you how do you navigate talking to people? You know, I couldn't be any more fortunate because Arnold Kaufman, the owner of Arnold's Way, is actually my best friend, and Arnold's Way has been in, in my life for for se past several years, all, all along this transition. All right. Um, almost no one has that. I, I met a, a great guy named Jason Young from uh, right outside Atlantic City, New Jersey, and he was the potluck speaker in April 2013. And uh, he, he told me, he's like, I never met a raw vegan before. And I, I was just stunned by that statement because sometimes I, I, I take it for granted. I, you know, I don't always keep it at the forefront of my mind that everyone has this experience. So that's made it really easy as far as getting in touch with like-minded people and learning and sharing. Yeah, Arnold is, is a powerhouse, and I, I really want to interview him. If, if you can hook me up with him. We, we tried once, and we didn't have the right uh, connection, but... Uh, we'll that, set guy, it up. that guy is a powerhouse, and uh, I think he – how long has he been doing this, Brian? He's been Rob Egan since 1998. He opened Arnold's Way in 1992. At first it was a vitamin store, and then it shifted to vegetarian. He had a small uh, cafe aspect. And then he saw T.C. Fry, and he went Rob Vegan overnight in, in 1998. All right. And, and then he, uh, he left Young in uh, Philadelphia suburb or, or Philadelphia neighborhood and moved to Lansdale, Pennsylvania, which is 20 miles outside the city. Okay, okay. Yeah, okay. I'm actually at Arnold's house right now. I live at Arnold's house. Oh, yeah. oh okay, okay, great. <laughs> uh, all right, all right. Well, um, yeah, it's, it's – and, and, you know, one thing I'll throw in here, and I've said it maybe before, but – you know, you see a lot of medical doctors who are finally getting some press because they're they're raw fooders now, or maybe like a Dr. McDougal who's a, a vegan, and um, they're having they're actually doing some studies that are showing some evidence that uh, of the benefits that can come from living this way. But if we go back, there were folks like T. C. Fry, and prior to him, Dr. Herbert Shelton, uh, and and many folks who were not doctors who were not trained in the medical profession, but who advocated this way of living. And, and there have been people who've been uh, recovering from tumors and, and healing all kinds of diseases through this way of living for so many years. And I'm glad that, that the public's getting to know some of the current people that are into this, but I sometimes feel that a lot of these old names are forgotten, and, and we stand on their shoulders, you know. Absolutely. There's a, a great guy you might want to interview. His name is Dan McGrogan. He opened a raw food cafe in February in Luzerne, Pennsylvania. It's in the scranton Wilkes-Barre area. Uh, he actually just came to visit Arnold's Way yesterday with his, okay. with his two chefs. Um, Dan is an excellent student of natural hygiene. He speaks very fondly of Shelton and Fry. Okay, okay. Yeah, he'd be a great resource. And uh, his cafe is just – here's a great example of raw food. This guy opens a cafe in a town of 3,000 people, and they are, like, pounding down a door. And after one month, he decided to almost triple in size. Wow. Wow, that's so awesome. He just wrote a couple, a couple of stories from my magazine they published last week. And he says, if you think raw food is the way of the future, he's like, it is the way for now. <laughs> Beautiful. I love yeah, it. That's <laughs> Tremendous that's spirit. All right. Um, so uh, – Maybe you could tell me, since, you're, since you've been connected with, I, I, it seems to me I get the impression from Arnold a lot of what he's about is helping people heal. So, and, and since you've been interacting with him so long and the people that you interact through the work you've done, can you tell us about some of the miracle stories that have occurred, some of the illnesses that people have overcome? Oh, sure. There's a wonderful girl. Her name is Esperanza. I, I don't want to mispronounce the spelling of her last name. It's B-I-T-E. Okay. Uh, she actually came to visit uh, Arnold's Way, uh, I think it was in January, and it was the most remarkable story I ever heard. Uh, she had celiac disease and multiple food allergies, and almost every food was making her sick. And she was, by 18 years old, she was down to 40 pounds. And the, the photos are just terrific. She was bedridden, and wow. she, might, she might, really might not have had so much time left. And one day she discovered grapes, and grapes actually made her feel good. So she wound up eating nothing but grapes for six months. Wow. And, yeah, and, and in time she began introducing more fruits, and some fruits gave her trouble for, for a while. I think bananas was one of them. 
uh, she would have to go back to different fruits, just playing playing games with them to see exactly how they would work and how they would uh, how they would uh, settle in her belt in her belly in her right. system. Uh, Megan Chereau, that's uh, another fantastic story. She was 13 when she was diagnosed with, with stage three brain cancer, and now she's 18 and thriving, living in Hawaii, training for a triathlon. Uh, I've heard, that, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Both of them wrote stories for my magazine as well when I go into more detail. Um, but Megan actually found Arnold, that, and uh, that was really the saving grace. And she, she, she ate a high-fat diet for about six months and saw some healing, but she didn't really get the results she was after until she went no-fat raw. And for a long time, and she might still be eating this way, she eliminated overt fats just so she could have maximum healing take place. You know, I'm, I'm glad you bring that up, and since you've been doing the raw thing for quite a while, I'm sure you're familiar. It seems like a lot of folks will, will try a raw food approach. They begin doing a, a relatively high-fat raw approach. They run into problems, and then they revert back to a standard American diet or something not that healthy. So maybe you could talk a little bit about that. Uh, do, you, do you think that a high-fat raw approach might be useful as a transitional thing and then they can get off it as soon as possible or what would you take on that absolutely i think it definitely has value as a transitional as a tr transitional food uh, for example arnold's way serves food that could uh, meet anyone anywhere where they are on a diet there are transitional foods such as cheeseburgers and pizza things people are used to and they're, they're delicious and it's just completely different dish from an actual cheeseburger or pizza but still very yummy but vegan, but vegan, right? Absolutely, absolutely. And it serves the purpose and it meets them where they are. I mean, if, if I were to tell anyone to hit the ground running, eat like me, uh, 22 bananas a day, 11 oranges a day, plus more fruit and a big salad, it's just, it's too, it's overwhelming. Yeah, thank so you. I think, yeah. Yeah, I, I think I it's good to take some steps. Yeah, yeah, it's very practical. And, you know, for some, for some young folks, like a, maybe a 15 year old, it's easy to immediately make a transition like that. But for somebody who's maybe 65 and they've been eating a standard American diet their whole life, it's, I think it's wise to give them a little leeway to gradually transition. Absolutely. I think uh, having fruit for breakfast is a very easy change for most. Uh, a lot of people wouldn't think twice about it and they'll just go for it. But once you tell them it, that you advise them to have uh, fruit for lunch, then it, the hands go up, say, whoa, 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 when am I going to have some real food? Trying to convince, yes, fruit is real food. You have to eat it in great quantity to get your calories. But. Right. Yeah, and I love the way it happened for you. It's like you started, you started adding smoothies, and you just kept seeing benefits, and you're like, well, I'm just going to do the smoothie instead of my lunch, you know? So yeah. I Absolutely, yeah. Once I went raw, though, I, I, it's like the, uh, my momentum kind of went off for a bit because – I wasn't certain whether you could just have smoothies, you know, throughout the day. Three yeah. big smoothies. Am I, am I allowed to do that? <laughs> so I was having a salad for lunch. And there just wasn't enough calories in it. I wasn't using any fat. Yeah. Um, but after a few months, uh, I figured it out. Uh, Harley Johnstone, durian rider, 30 bananas a day. He was uh, talking in great detail about calories and counting calories and how he was yo-yoing until he began counting his calories. And I'm a huge advocate of that because – I think the average person just doesn't just doesn't equate how much food is needed on this diet. Um, okay. I like to say that if you go to Ruby Tuesday or something like that, you might get a cheeseburger of this size. It's a thousand calories, but a watermelon is also a thousand calories. It's that large, you know. It takes a lot more room to fit that in the belly. And just because our stomach might be might be full, we we are truly satisfied. It takes some time. Great. That's a great point. And, and would you say that's more of an issue if you're doing completely raw than if you're doing, say, a cooked vegan diet? Like, uh, it, it, I, I've seen several cases where folks actually lost so much weight on a raw vegan diet that they, they started adding some cooked foods just to gain a little bit of weight because, you know, family members would freak out. Not that they, not that they actually were unhealthy in any way. It was probably, they had extreme vitality, but they'd actually, add some cooked rice or potatoes to gain a little bit of weight. I've heard that as well. I mean, I've seen some of those stories. Uh, you know, I think it, in some cases it, it, there was no clear understanding of the caloric value of different foods. Okay. I, really, I really encourage people to go after this with the eye of the tiger. And if you really want to succeed, you're going to have to put in some time and read some books from a, a, several different people to have a clear understanding. 
Um, I've seen some people just want to gravitate and kind of eat what wherever their body's leading them, but you're not going to get enough calories if you're going to eat berries all day. Or okay. um, like strawberries are only 145 calories a pound. I, I love them, but seven pounds of strawberries, that's quite expensive, and it's going to take a long time to get down. Yeah, there's some practical logistics involved, absolutely. Um, now, let's say, what would you say to someone who has – decided that they they still need some cooked food for maybe psychological reasons or they just like in the winter they like having something warm um what would you say to that you think that's an acceptable way to go everyone has a is free to make his or her own own choice on that i, I really advocate wholly raw but i don't i don't really harp on that message on my website i don't want it to be off-putting in any way yeah I might advocate holy raw, but people are free to stop wherever they choose. And, and, and that's great if we can have people eating fruit for breakfast and lunch. And if they ate potatoes and salad for dinner, that, that's still a victory in my book for, for now. And, you know, 20 years from now, this is going to be much more accepted. And we'll have so many more people just willing to go 100%. The restaurant situation will change. We're just going to have more raw vegan cafes opening up. I love that, Brian. I love that. And to me, the, the main... Uh the main issue for me, the, the main interest for me now is just communicating veganism to a broader public that's still animal-based. And then beyond that, a secondary issue is, you know, communicating about the, the benefits of a fully raw approach. Yeah. Absolutely. The, yeah, Harley and Freely of 30 Bananas a Day, there was such a great fallout with the whole Woodstock Fruit Festival drama from November, and I really think that's unfortunate. Uh, I think... I think the goal is if we can get people to have fruit for breakfast and fruit for lunch, then these people are going to be more receptive to going holy raw. It yeah. shouldn't just be this, uh, I'm at the king of the mountain, and if you're not here, then you're nobody. You know, I think Harley kept saying that a lot of people were, were trying this lifestyle, and you know, it's not so easy for everybody. Uh, okay. some, some people, it takes a little longer. It might take them two, three years to transition, and that's fine. Everyone at their own pace. But some people were just going back to eating animal products because they didn't know that it was acceptable to eat potatoes or rice or beans for dinner or vegan pizza even. Exactly, yeah. exactly, yeah. That's, that would be the shame. If, if you're so strict about raw that it's preventing people from becoming vegan, that's a problem. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, I think there are probably only about 500 people in the world, maybe a 1,000 max, who are really 100% wholly like, fruit-based raw. And even, you know, I'm saying I'm 100%, but I eat nuts and seeds, and a lot of them are processed at temperatures that are that are rendering them technically cooked. That's but, a great point. That's a great point. And also, despite your emphasis on fruit, you do eat a good bit of greens. So. Absolutely. I, yeah. I, I really find the greens uh, help a lot. Uh, I, I, as far as transitioning, I think a lot of people just don't eat enough greens. And yeah. Um, as, as far as losing weight, some people just don't have the weight loss as quickly as they like, and I think part of that is they're not eating greens. Greens are so cleansing. Yeah. Uh, some people have shared their experiences with me that once they began introducing more greens into their diet, weight began dropping off. So, Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, I've, I've seen that too. That's, that's amazing. Um, all right. Um, now I want to, let's see, how am I doing here? I tell you what, Brian, bear with me. I'm gonna I'm gonna hang up on you one more time. We're gonna do a part three. Okay. And uh, that way, it'll it'll hopefully save a, a problem later on. So I'll call you right back.